Hello, James here from Needy Cat Games. I'm one of the designers of Myth and Goal, and I'm here to talk to you all about solo play. Uh, developing an AI system was something we knew we wanted to do for Myth and Goal from the very start. And we knew it was going to be a challenge, but wow, uh, it has been a heck of a ride. In the past, I've designed quite a few AI systems for dungeon crawl type games and that sort of thing. Um, and those tend to amount to some variation on move towards the heroes and hit them. In a sports game like Myth and Goal, it's, there's so much more to consider. You know, you've got field coverage, risk management, when to score. Long story short, it's been a roller coaster getting to this point, but I'm really happy with how the system has turned out. We're still applying some final touches, some polish and, you know, last playtesting to the solo mode, which means the tabletop simulator mod isn't quite ready for public consumption just yet. Uh, but we knew you'd want to have a look, so I thought this video would be a good compromise something in the middle that you can you know check out um before we do though let's have a look at some of the principles behind solo play first and foremost the main principle was really obviously it needs to be a system that allows a solo player to play myth and goal have a fun and challenging time and not need an opponent next up the rules need to be as compatible as possible with the two-player mode of the game we wanted the, all, all the fundamental principles of the game to be the same, all the main mechanics and things. We didn't want to have the we didn't want the player to have to learn a whole new game to play the game solo. Um, we decided the, ga the game's rules could be fairly granular in the solo mode, maybe a little bit more complex than the two-player mode. Um, when we design the two-player mode, the same way when we design any of our games, really, we always make them as, as accessible and straightforward as possible, knowing that. People might, um, you know, want to play the game and want to get a friend to play, um, you know, a family member, a friend, someone who might not be as invested as they are. And so with the two-player mode, we always want to make it really approachable. With the solo mode, you know, we assume that the player is going to be fairly invested anyway because they're wanting to play this solo. So we don't mind a little bit more complexity as long as it means the game is challenging and re rewarding. But, importantly, that doesn't mean the rules can be really complex. We didn't want pages of flowcharts, diagrams, you know, behaviour tables. Um, the system needed to be similar to the rest of Myth and Goal in that it's quick, easy to, to learn, easy to use. No kind of complicated looking up type stuff. This was a real balancing act, and I think we've landed in a pretty good place. Uh, finally, the AI, the AI needed to be a bit unpredictable because, you know, there's a, a danger when you come up against a simple AI system that the player can start gaming it and figuring out what it's going to do. So we wanted to have something in there to throw some curveballs, and uh, we think we've done that. So anyway, that's kind of where my head was at when I was designing this. Uh, let's stop messing around. Let's have a look at it in Tabletop Simulator and see how it ended up. Here we go. Here's the current build of the solo play rules in Tabletop Simulator. Um, I know, I know, you want to get your hands on this. You want to, You want to reach in and play it, but just be patient, bear with me. We will have this available for you very soon. We don't want to um, kind of release something that we're not quite happy with yet. We are 90% of the way there, but there's a little bit of polish. A few grey areas need squeezing down, and uh, our playtesters are doing a great job with that. Give us time, you will get to have a go. For now, you know, watch along as I talk you through it. Um, oh, quick note at this point. Probably should have said this sooner. I'm going to assume that you, the viewer, already know how the two-player version of Myth and Goal works. If you don't, um, I would recommend pausing this video, go and watch the how to play, go and read the rule book, whatever it is you want to do, because um, I don't want to have to explain everything twice. And, you know, so I'm, I'm going into this video with an assumption that you know how the two-player mode works. Uh, okay, everyone caught up, everyone on the same page, fantastic. So as you can see, everything here looks pretty familiar. Like I said in the principles, it's you know 90% the same game. Um, as the solo manager, your side of the board looks pretty much as you'd expect. Um, you'll notice you've got all the dice on your side because um, unfortunately technology hasn't got to the point where we can get um, a board game to roll dice for you. Um, but uh, other than that, everything looks pretty much the same. You've got your player cards, you've got in your squad slots and bench slots. You've got your focus card, your tactics deck. When it's your turn, you are playing exactly as you would against a human opponent. The only thing, the only time the game changes is during the AI team's turn. So here, as you can see, the ruffians are human controlled. The uh, anvils, the dwarf team, are AI controlled. And hey, look over here on the right, we've got some new components. Let's see what we've got. First up, we've got the risk gauge. The risk gauge is uh, like the, the, the beating heart, the nerve center 
of the solo play experience. And it's kind of the bit that makes the whole thing tick. This is the thing that addresses the biggest challenge in designing this AI system, which is that you wanted to make it feel like you're squaring off against a real human manager, right? But a human manager reads the game state and acts accordingly. They're not just basing their decisions on a couple of simple rules. So what this does is it models, you know, uh, what the game state is, when you should be pushing your players to the point of exhaustion, when you should risk an infraction, when you should play it safe and recover. All of that is handled by the risk gauge. At the start and end of every AI team turn, the risk gauge, the token here in the middle, resets to zero, and then you adjust it left or right by following the three boxes below. Um, so first up, the later you are in the period, the more the token slides to the right. Um, the more, uh, If you've got more standing players in the field, it goes left. If your opponent's got more, it goes right. Same kind of thing with the score. As you can see... As you go towards the right, that's red. That's the more risky end. That's where the AI team will do riskier plays, um, push their players harder. The green end is where they will take a breather, let their players recover some fatigue. Um, and basically, in the middle, you've got yellow, your default, which is kind of where the AI team will play fairly conservatively in a fairly balanced manner. Um, and the risk gauge ties into this thing above it, which is called the strategy board. Um, each team in the game has got two strategy boards, one for if they're the aggressor, that is the team that starts a period with the ball, and one for if they're the defender, so they're the team that hasn't got the ball. Uh, each one's double-sided. You can uh, flip it, basically, if the, if the team, so this one here, the Anvil's team, is the defender, uh, but if they re uh, retrieve the ball, then you flip this over, and now they're on the offence. The strategy guard does two things. First of all, it determines the team's setup. So at the top here, you can see uh, you've got numbered circles representing each player in the Anvil's team. In the first period, they'll appear exactly as you see here. In later periods, things get a little bit more interesting, and the AI does kind of a sorting mechanic to uh, make sure that players aren't sent in when they're not ready. So um, you set them up in numerical order. So Stern McG McGunry here would be player number one. He's the first one to go in. And before setting up that, that player, you check to see if they've got uh, two infractions, so a final warning, or whether they uh, are exhausted. If so, you swap them out for a player in the bench, the, the lowest numbered player in the bench uh, area there, uh, who isn't also exhausted or on a final warning. So the AI team selects players who are in the best position to, to do things. Um once the game itself is actually underway, then the strategy card determines how the players act on the AI team's turn. Uh, the design here isn't final. We're probably going to do some work to make it look a bit clearer. But uh, as I say, bear with us. Final polish is still happening. Um, unlike human-controlled teams, this is the biggest departure, really, from the standard rules. The AI team doesn't have a limit of four actions per turn. Instead, each player activates in turn according to a set of objectives, which you can see here. Um, this means they might get a few more actions than their opponent. Uh, but this kind of balances out against the fact that human players got, you know, things like free will, human cunning, that sort of stuff. In our experience, that tends to balance out quite nicely. Um, so, yeah, this card will tell you which order to activate players. In this case, it's uh, activate them in terms of who's closest to the ball. Uh, whenever a player is activated, you go down the list one numbered objective at a time until you find one that they can feasibly achieve. Um, if they've got a chance of completing it, they'll carry out the steps. If not, they'll go on to the next one. Here's the key thing, though. You, the solo manager, have to control the player to carry out their objective to the best of their ability. If they've got a special rule that, that, that would apply and would give them an advantage, you use it. So the AI determines the objective, what the player is trying to do. You, the human player, you carry it out. You deal with the nitty gritty of the exact rules, using the normal rules for actions so that it works exactly like it does on your turn. This means that you're not doing any decision making. You're just kind of doing the legwork. And that saves a heck of a lot of laborious rules, tables, charts and nonsense that wouldn't be fun to write. They wouldn't be fun to balance. They would not be fun to play with. So uh, that's kind of... One of the key things of the AI system here is it's it's the AI system makes the makes the calls and then you carry them out. Of course, there will still be some uh, potential for decisions within the objective. Usually, how far you'll push the player and how much fatigue they'll take, and whether they'll use the gambit dice. So, 
conveniently, the AI covers that as well. Down here on the strategy card, you can see the risk table. It's got two rows. The top one is the fatigue buffer. Um, and this is kind of how much capacity for additional fatigue the AI wants their players to have before they're pushed to exhaustion. So if we're in the yellow and a player has a fatigue limit of three, and you know that means they'll take up to three fatigue and then stop because one more would push them into exhaustion. So that's our, our one on that, uh, that part over there. Um, this might mean that they carry out part of an objective and then stop. And so be it. That will also determine when, uh, you know, when it's the the, the the solo players or the solo manager's turn. Um, if the an AI player has a choice of take fatigue or be placed prone, it will tell you whether they will take fatigue at that point. Uh, the lower road shows you when the AI will use a gambit dice on a roll based on the uh, the margin of uh, the difference in dice pools between the active player and the opposing player. So again, if we're in the yellow, it will only use a gambit die if the solo team has a two dice advantage. So you can see this is where the risk gauge and strategy board are working together to create a dynamic AI that's responding to the game state, while also offloading a whole load of the parts that would be complex to model onto the player. Um, oh, and finally on the strategy board, we've got the coverage diagram here. Um, the objectives will kind of pull the AI players into the positions you see here, prioritising red over yellow and yellow over green, uh, to ensure they've got good coverage of the field. So you're not getting all the AI players bunching up into one part of the field and uh, the other team getting the chance to run around them. Um, the colour of the area also ties into the risk level. So a player in a coverage area will never treat the risk as any lower than the colour of their spot. If they're in a red spot directly in front of the gate, they always act as though the risk level is red. So that means that players in certain positions on the field will risk, th uh, risk themselves more, they'll push themselves more, they'll use the gambit dice more because they're in a really vital position. Um, also, you always treat the enemy ball carrier as a red coverage spot. And that has a whole load of things, which you'll see when we play through the game. Okay, so far we've got a solid system, but it's quite predictable. And that's where the behaviour deck comes in. This takes the place of the team focus card that managed teams have. Um, and sure enough, each focus has a corresponding behaviour deck. So we've got versatile, nimble, devious, and so on and so forth. So you get the same level of modularity as the two-player game mode. You combine a faction and a behaviour deck, and that gives you an AI team. Uh, at the start of each AI turn, after assessing the risk level, you draw one of these cards, which will give you unexpected twists to the team's tactics. Um, they might alter the risk level, give players access to additional actions, provide buffs, and so on. Some of them have different rules depending on the risk level. So that's another way the AI team reacts to the game state. These cards mean you can never quite predict what the AI team is going to do on their turn, which keeps you guessing, just as though you're playing a human opponent. Um, also, of course, it adds to the modularity. You know, When you're up against a, um, a human opponent, you'll get a very different game, whether it's a devious anvils team or a nimble anvils team. And the same thing applies here. So even if it's just you playing, you're not just going to have um, you know, three different teams to play against. You're going to have a whole variety based on uh, you know, multiplying the number of factions by the number of behavior decks. Right, okay, I've teased you long enough. Shall we actually have a look and see how an AI turn plays out? Uh, I've set the board up here. This is um, a game of the Ruffians versus Anvils, which is the demo we're going to be releasing. Uh, the Anvils are the away team, uh, and they're the, they're the AI team. So I, as the Ruffians, the solo player, I've already taken my first turn. We're into turn two. Uh, as you can see, I pushed Goltran right up the middle. Classic no-nonsense Ruffians play. And uh, tried tackling McGurney, but little effect. Gave him one fatigue. Meanwhile, uh, Hron and Shagura moved the ball up the midfield area. Uh, ready for a scoring attempt next turn. Let's see how that plays out, though. So it's the Anvil's turn. First thing that happens is we set the risk level. We're on turn two. Uh, I know it says round there, but as I say, not final. Still working on a few few details. Uh, we each have five standing players. The scores are draw at zero, so the token stays at zero. Okay, straightforward. Then we flip a behavior card. Uh, so, hey, look, it's Burst of Speed. No surprises there. Um, we saw it a minute ago, but now we know what this is. This is coming out. The risk level is yellow, so we're using the top box, which means any Anvils players who dash this round can move an extra area. Uh, I, if, if I'd set things up so that I knew my players were safely out of harm's way, that could really screw things up a little bit because, you know, with one dash, they're going an extra two. With two dashes, going an extra four. That's, that's a pretty quick team. And something that I couldn't necessarily have planned again, uh, planned to mitigate. Um, after we've done the behavior card, we go into uh, re the recovery phase, just like in a human team's turn. 
every player recovers one fatigue. There's only one token here. Let's get rid of that. Uh, and it's straight into player activations. So here we are. This is the meat of the AI system. So we're going by the players who are closest to the ball, starting with um, Hamilton here. Uh, now, the ball isn't loose. So let's have a look over at the uh, the objectives. Ball isn't loose. So ignore, ignoring objective one. Next up, it's attack the ball carrier. That is definitely a possibility. Uh, this objective has got two steps. Run towards the ball carrier, tackle the ball carrier. Two separate actions. So uh, Donald here has got a speed of two. So first step is uh, covered without having to dash. Nice and easy. One fatigue for that. It would take two more fatigue to exhaust him. So he's well within his fatigue buffer. He's fine to take a second action. Um, due to the yellow risk level, as I said earlier, he would stop when it would take one more fatigue to exhaust him. So he's going to go for the tackle. He's got a power of three. That's three dice for the away team. Uh, Hron's resolve is also three, but he's got some support from Shigura, meaning four dice in total for the home team. Let's gather those together into our funky tabletop simulator later uh, dice rolling mat. I made this to make things a little bit clearer for people who are newer to tabletop simulator. It's nothing to do with the, do with the game. It won't be in the game itself. It's just here for this. Um, the difference in dice pools is one. And, of course, Donald is treating the risk level as red because the, he's in the ball carrier's area, so he treats it as a red coverage spot. So his margin for adding a gambit die is just a one dice disadvantage, which he's got. So the away team gambit die comes into the roll. Now I'm the opposing manager. I have the choice of throwing my own gambit die. Uh, yeah, let's do it. Why not? So we've got uh, a whole handful of dice. So let's roll those. Um, oh, weird. The, uh, the shot cut there. Who knows how that happened? Uh, you never saw anything, right? Um, we've got a total of four hits for Donald, three blocks for Ron, so a partial success. Uh, I'm the opposing manager. I choose. Uh, I can either give him a fatigue or place him prone. Don't want to lose the ball, so he's going to take the fatigue and stay standing. Uh, he's on two with a fatigue limit of three. Don't like where this is going, so he might be falling over sometime soon. Also, let's not forget to put a fatigue on Donald for the tackle action. He's done now, though. He's completed his objective. So next closest player to the ball is Benry Von Klint. The ball's still in Toronto's grubby mitts. So we're on to objective two again. Similar situation to last time. Benry runs in, takes the fatigue, then tackles. He's a bit heftier, though. Four power. And he's got Donald supporting now. So that's five dice against the home team's four. No gambit dies needed for the ambles this time. Uh, I'm going to throw one in. It's early, but, you know, live dangerously. And this is only a little demo, right? So let's roll. Uh, oh, look, another weird cut. How strange. It's almost like someone's rolling the dice off screen and then uh, arranging them and, uh, yeah, coming back in. How odd. Um, we've got five hits against my pitiful one block. That's a full success. So Huron's going prone, dropping the ball. Um, and, yeah, I'm aware how weird it looks to flip the players upside down on Tabletop Simulator, but uh, if someone's got a better idea, let me know. I thought I'd figured it out at one point, how to lay players down, but it's eluded me ever since. Uh, oh yeah, let's not not, for, not forget to put a fatigue on Benry. And then we're on to Stern, who's next closest to the ball. Now the ball is loose, but it's in an area with two of his teammates, so he can't recover it. There's no room to enter the area, um, which means the ball's lost in the scrum. He also can't attack the ball carrier, which takes him to objective three, threaten a player in the anvil's half. There's already a player in his area, so he skips step one, goes straight on to step two, and throws a tackle at Goldram. Power four, Goldtrans resolve is three, one die margin, that's not enough for a gambit die, as we're on yellow, again, he's not in the ball carrier's area, so he's not treating the risk as red. Uh, I'm not interested in adding one, so it's a nice straight uh, four versus three roll. Um, stop calling attention to the cuts. Um, a solid defence makes another partial partial success, and I'll give Goldtran the fatigue to keep him standing, even though he's now at his limit. Oh dear. Uh, and of course, one more fatigue for Stern for the action. Next, it's Brigitte. She's not able to recover the ball or attack the ball carrier or threaten a player in the Anvil's half, so she's on to objective four, cover the field. She's already in a coverage spot, so she won't do anything. This often happens. She's not taking any taking action, doesn't take any fatigue. This kind of balances out the fact that the uh, AI team doesn't have a limit of four actions. Sometimes they'll decide they're in the best spot, they'll stay there and not do anything. Finally, Fiora's going to run a cover uh, run to a coverage spot, same sort of thing, and she's got a choice of two that she can reach with a dash. Um, players will always prioritise a coverage spot that contains an enemy over one that doesn't, so she'll move here. One fatigue for the run, one for the dash. Uh, she could have dashed an extra space if she needed to because of the behaviour card. In this case, didn't need to as it happened. Um, and she'll stop there because that's the end of the objective. She won't throw a tackle because it doesn't say she needs to. So there we go. That is a full Anvil's AI turn. All five players have been activated. 
Only four of them really did nothing. They used a couple more than four actions. But, as I say, that balances out against the fact that I, the solo player, will have a few tricks up my sleeve that the uh, AI couldn't predict. So yeah, all that remains is to assess the risk level again to see whether they'll take fatigue or use Gambit Dice during my turn. Reset to zero, check the three criteria. Uh, one of the ruffians is down, so it just moves one to the left. The AI is feeling slightly safer than it was before. Uh, if that, if things uh, continue as they are, then the AI team will play it very safe and stop uh, throwing in Gambit Dice and taking risks. So there we go, that's it. That is the uh, AI system for Myth and Goal. As I say, it's still... A little bit of polish and refinement refinement away from being uh, complete and available for release. But we are so happy with how it is right now. Um, remember, Myth and Goal is designed to be fully modular. So you can play one-off solo games. You can play a solo ladder league. You can include a couple of solo teams in a multiplayer league to even out the numbers or make things interesting. Um, there is actually a simplified system for resolving AI versus AI games with a single dice roll. Although I know for a fact there's going to be someone out there adventurous enough to run two AI teams against each other and uh, see what happens. I, I can't wait, frankly, to see how that all plays out. So yeah, that's all from me. Thank you very much for watching. Once again, I've been James from Needy Cat Games. And uh, thank you so much for your support and interest in this game. We hope you enjoy it and you support us on Kickstarter.